Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales, Tales from, from Outer, Outer Space. Space. I hope you enjoy. Outsourced Warfare, written by Damascus Seraph. Accessing Documentary. 3432 Galactic Standard Year. 52 years ago. Galactic University Password. Password 123. Access granted. User student 325432AP. Downloading video. Display. Add. Do you need extra? Skip. Add. Skipped. Video playing. The hologram lights up, revealing a Terran male standing in front of a holographic projector. Text appearing on a screen showing that man's name to be Dr. James Garson. A list of credentials soon follow under the name as he begins to speak. Welcome everyone to my lecture on the topic of outsourced warfare phenomenon that occurred in the galaxy and its conclusion during the Great Mercenary War which ended roughly five years ago. No doubt many of you are still unsure of exactly what happened during that war, as many things were still unclear even a few years after the conclusion. But I believe now that we have almost everything catalogued and documented, which is why I'm creating this lecture. The university student watching the recordings take a few notes typing away on his second monitor as he continues to look at the hologram, taking a moment to take a bite out of some snacks that he had prepared earlier. Now to begin, we need to do a little history lesson. Beginning 435 years ago, during the rise of the company's period of the galactic history, after the Great War of Galactic Peace, the armies of the various remaining nations were demobilized. However, hundreds of thousands, millions even, had no other skill set other than combat. Thus the first of the great mercenary companies were formed. Many were absorbed by others, merged or wiped out by the main three that grew to the great heights that were Martial Elite, Reconnaissance Combat Solutions, or Mercs for short, the Brown Dwarf Navy, and the Rockstoner Corporation. A series of logos and insignia for the three mercenary bands show up. Screenshots are taken by the student for further remembrance in case it's on the test, which it always is. Now, during the following century of the mercenary armies and navies' ascendants, they were used as private security forces by trading companies and occasionally as auxiliary forces for existing armies and navies of various nations. However, as budget for military ventures declined further in the nations, the mercenary bands were employed more and more to fight as the nation's army and navy instead. Often against other mercenary bands or multiple mercenaries. Of course, being mercenaries, most had more allegiance to the credits that they were being paid than their employers. So half the time, other nations won their minor wars by simply bribing the other mercenaries to join the opposing side. This continued for the entirety of the ascendant period of the mercenary companies and more than likely would have continued were it not for the first contact of the Terran Federation. For future reference, I shall explain how momentous this occasion was for those in the future who had not lived through it. Most of the galaxy at this point had been thoroughly explored, and the age of unclaimed star stems in the galaxy was coming to an end. The last frontier was the space that the current Terran Federation resides in. When the Terrans were discovered and more importantly, were already occupying every system that was hoped to be free real estate, it made many nations nearby quite unhappy, especially since there had already been agreements and treaties made where certain sections would be considered their territory. Now the Terrans themselves were quite excited to finally prove intelligent alien life existed and began intermixing with the galactic community as best they could. However, a misconception occurred during negotiations. The Terran Army, Navy, and Marines were thought to be a very strong mercenary bands that simply monopolized the Terran market for each section of warfare. After all, the Terran Federation wasn't as unified as it is now, and even then, it was thought that they were even more decentralized. So, to the Terran Navy, received a few requests for hiring ships and the likes from a few companies was quite strange. And upon the local mercenary companies finding out traders were trying to subvert their fixed prices, by using this new third party, issued a warning to the Terran Navy to get the Mercenary Coalition's permission to do business outside Terran space, which the Navy outright refused. They didn't do business anyways. They were military arm of the Terran government, so when Terran Navy warships were escorting diplomats to another meeting with their neighbors, 
they were stopped by a larger fleet of mer mercenaries, demanding payment from the diplomats for safe transport and practically ordering the Terran Navy to leave or be destroyed. The student was quickly becoming engrossed in the story. He had only heard the war in vague details before, mainly the outcome only. The Terrans were both insulted and did not take the threat lightly. As the Navy was not a mercenary band, they were not about to hand the diplomats to what they perceived as nothing more than thugs trying to extort the new kids in the block. So they refused, both out of pride and practicality. The Terrans at this point had quite a fierce and honorable military tradition. They had a civil war only 70 years prior, and the armed forces, the Navy in particular, was integral in the saving of many worlds cut off by the opposing forces, putting great effort on logistics for food and medicine to those affected by the war. Thus, the Navy not only had combat experience less than a generation before this event, but the officers and enlisted of the Navy had morale that would not be dissuaded by fierce odds, and certainly not by coin. Things that mercenaries would soon learn. Well, Soon after, the Terran diplomats and their escorts were forced to retreat back to Terran space, refusing the mercenaries' demands, only to return with an entire battle group as an escort. Now this was a drastic escalation in the eyes of the mercenaries. Typical fare for them is back and forth of showboating, maybe a warning shot or two, a bribe to an officer here or there, then maybe an agreement can be made. After all, mercenaries are there to make money, not to actually die. So in Merck's eyes, they had done the usual demanding of payment for passage. That suddenly, the Terran Navy brought an entire battle group of warships, armed and ready to force their way through the Merck's territory. As each mercenary band usually operates in a few places as monopolies until they're kicked out by other mercenaries or bought out. The speaker takes a short drink from his bottle before speaking again. So, as you can imagine, when the small fleet of mercenaries guarding the hyperlane point for safe passage encountered the Terran fleet, they immediately retreated and warned their superiors, who, might I add, were not very happy about this slight. They took every ship in the area and put it in the next choke point system, leading to the Terran's destination. And when the Terrans arrived, they made the greatest mistake that they could have. As mentioned before, they stand a fair of for mercenaries with showboating first, which they did with their much larger fleet now, and then uh, firing a warning shot. A warning shot that barely grazed the shields of one of the Terran flagships, which held their diplomats. The mercenaries purposely did that to show how accurate their guns were, showing that they could have hit them if they tried, but didn't. The Terrans obviously didn't take that that way, and took it as an open aggression, and promptly opened fire with every weapon they had. The mercenaries were, as I've heard from the survivor, completely and utterly shocked and unprepared for an actual conflict. They were trained, of course, had the highest quality of equipment, and not just anybody becomes a mercenary. It takes a certain personality type that puts less emphasis on empathy and selflessness. However, most mercenaries had never had combat experience other than the occasional warning shots on pirates. At most, they would exchange a little fire with other mercenaries until someone's shields popped and they surrendered and sold back their mercenary companies for ransom. Now, with their first salvo, multiple of the smaller escort ships on the Merc side were immediately destroyed. Multiple squadrons of fighter craft were racing towards them, and hundreds of missiles were seconds away from hitting their targets. The Terrans didn't care about using limited force. They didn't care about ransoming the fleet should they surrender. They shot at their diplomat, so in their mind the gloves were off, and the only sensible thing to do is to kill everything that was a threat. And unlike their mercenary counterparts, who didn't load their weapons until they were sure that they were going to use them, and use only what's necessary to limit expenses, the Terrans didn't care how much it cost to expend ammunition, and they always kept the gun seconds from being loaded. By the time the Merc's fleet had fled the system, over half the ships that arrived were either destroyed or disabled and surrendered. Boarded soon after by marines, despite the slight technological advantage the Merc's fleet had over the Terrans. Now this, playing advertisement. My friend, you look like you could use a skip advertisement. Playing video. Had caused quite a ripple in the mercenary community. War was expensive. It's why most nations had abandoned their own militaries in favor of mercenaries. 
but mercenaries don't like losing ships and personnel. It costs money to replace those things, and money is all they care about. And another thing they care about is their reputation. More than one company has been destroyed or bought out after they'd lost all semblance of trust or competence in the eyes of the customers. So the Merck's company retreating after a single salvo and losing dozens of ships did not look good on them once word started getting out. Merck's, though, was one of the top dogs, so they had some leeway in recovering that smaller company's dirt. They were gunning after the Terran Navy with a vengeance. Another thing that wasn't fully understood by the mercenaries was that, since the Terran Navy wasn't a mercenary company, they had a full resources of the Terran Federation behind them. The largest mercenary fleet, being the top three, had somewhere between three to 4,000 ships each, including cargo ships for supply and smaller escort craft. The Terran Federation had between 15,000 combat ships alone. Half huh. were mothballed in dry docks or in orbital shipyards, but they were still bigger fleet than the two of the largest mercenary companies combined, and they could use their mothballed ships to make the fleet larger at a moment's notice. Not only that, they had volunteers from the entirety of Terran Federation, rather than the limited volunteers who joined the mercenary for financial reasons. The Terrans join as a duty to their state. Some even have generations of family members who served in one sector of the military or another, dating back to the first space flight of humanity. So not only did the Terrans have a numerical superiority over the mercenary bands, a populace and a nation who had supplied them with an endless munitions and ships and crews that are trained by veterans of a multi-decade long civil war with an esperit, their core, that would rather fight to the last bullet than retreat for a few coins. You can see how things weren't exactly looking favorable for the mercs. But there's one thing the mercenaries had over the Terrans, a lot of technology. As mentioned before, Terrans, while not too far behind the galactic standard, still used missiles, rail guns, and coil guns, only barely researching into the upgrade lasers and plasma-based weapons. So while the half of the Merc's fleet destroyed was impressive and destructive, if they had modern weapons, they would have entirely been obliterated. Since both fleets had gotten into such close range, this advantage of the Merc's would be the bane of the Terrans as tensions began to ramp up. The Mercs still haven't realized the Terran armed forces aren't mercenaries themselves and continue to send threats and continue to harass Terran traders to use their protection services, even in Terran space. Only leaving once a Terran warship or two showed up. Now, everyone is in no doubt knowing what's to come. Black Saturday, as the Terrans call it. An attack on a major space station of the Terran Navy, the closest to the borders with any mercenary territory. A combined force of mercs and a few smaller bands wanted to gain some notoriety. Assault the large station, a large shipyard dedicated to the maintenance and construction of chair and shipyards. Even the large three mercenary groups, private shipyards, are dwarfed by the station, and their assault went off without a hitch. Only acceptable losses to the attacking fleet, as the ship stationed there were not expecting an assault. And defenses were not prepared in time. Much of the station was destroyed. The Terran adjusts his glasses and takes a much darker tone of his voice. What the Mercs did not know was that that station was undergoing its 70th anniversary at the end of the Civil War, and it was where the peace was signed. Instead of hundreds of thousands of military personnel usually there, millions of civilians were on board celebrating the event, right as the Merc fleets attacked. Very few managed to escape alive. The warships docked in their repair bays for civilians to tour were also destroyed. Many weren't even combat capable, but relics of the Civil War. It was dubbed the Massacre of Hox's Shipyard. What was meant as a short strike against the mercenary company rivals to Mercs was instead a declaration of war against the Terran Federation. And the Navy itself was furious. Even the civilian populace of the Federation's rage had nothing to the fury the Navy had. During the speech, a video pops up behind the speaker, presumably from security camera as crowds of people are gathered around a window watching a ship dock with the shipyard only for more ships to arrive and begin firing upon the station. 
The camera feeds cuts off milliseconds after the debris from the ship docking shatters, the screen imitating a window. From the outside, through the hull. The moment the attack was finished and reports of the massacre were spread like wildfire. Note, spread like wildfire is a Terran phrase often used to describe some sort of news spreading rapidly, as wildfires and terror are notorious for spreading rapidly out of control throughout Terran space. The fleet of mercs were hounded on their way out of Terran space, constant attacks by lone patrol ships, small patrol fleets of corvettes and frigates, near suicidal assaults on their rear lines and escorts, some ships were outright destroyed, but that did not stop the Navy. Soon, an entire battle fleet arrived along with a dozen other patrol fleets banded together to intercept the fleeing mercs. They attacked, but were outnumbered and outgunned. They lost many ships, but continued to whittle away at the fleet, destroying a few heavier warships and multiple escorts before they were forced to retreat. Again, the merc fleets continued their retreat, but the Navy had tasted blood in the water, and they were circling like sharks. Note, Terran phrase sharks, being a waterbound carnivore that is attracted to the scent of blood. Slowly closing in, a fleet here to force the mercs to take a different route, a few raiding parties there to slow them down, and before they knew it, half of the entire Terran navy was surrounding them, blocking every hyperlane exit point and outnumbering them ten to one. The ensuing battle is known as the Battle of a Vengeance. Out of the 2,300 strong fleets to enter the Terran space, the hundreds of thousands of crew, only 32 ships surrendered, with under 700 crew left to be interrogated. Images show on screen of the hologram of the battle wreckage, along with the estimated losses tally for both sides. The Terrans, while having suffered triple the losses, they had reaped a bloody toll. What followed after the annihilation of the Merc's fleet were well, advertisement loading. Say your tentacles getting in the way of... Skip ad. Skipping ad. Subscribe to ad block accepted. Ads blocked. Playing video. Was absolute shock for the galaxy at large. Not only the fact that the biggest fleet of mercenaries assembled for one task in a hundred years being utterly annihilated, but the fact that these mercs had committed multiple war crimes and killed so many civilians. Suddenly, public opinion of many nations began to turn on the mercenaries once looking at them as necessary evil. Thugs pay to be more civilized mercenaries to protect people, if they didn't even protect what they were being paid for. Suddenly, even those mercenaries who had been unaffiliated or opposed to mercs were having their contracts expired without renewal. Nations were beginning to ask the Terran Federation if they could hire their navy to train and protect their trade lanes, even though the news of the Terran military not being a mercenary band has finally been disseminated to the majority of the galaxy. It was hard for the nations to not think of the Navy in such a way. However, the Terran Federation's laws did not allow the Navy to be used outside the borders unless escorting diplomats, exploring uncharted systems, or fighting a war, obviously. And, at this point, not much public pressure was being put in sending the Navy out of Federation space. The enemy who had killed thousands was killed, and those involved and survived were taken into custody, some handed over by other nations once mercs were disbanded. That was a few months the way things were going to be, until the speaker pauses for a dramatic effect, no doubt. The mercenaries, now losing money and contracts, were slowly expiring, and few were willing to rehire them, decided to force their old clients to accept their contracts mainly by raiding shipping and becoming the very pirates that they used to be hired to fight. All over the galaxy, mercenaries were threatening shipping lanes with exorbitant fees as recompense for not paying them, their protectors, their just dues. Now, more pressure was being put on the other nations, some pleading under the strain of the mercenaries' extortion to have the Terran Navy help them push out the mercenaries. But legally, there was nothing the Terran Federation could do it could not send Terran ships in peacetime to other nations. So, like any good politicians, they found a loophole of a place in Federation to these alien nations. So even if they were in the process of accepting or reviewing the deal, they would be, for all intents and purposes, Federation space. So with that sending a few documents and a few knowing looks, a revamped navy dusting off their mothballed ships, and the populace and crew with a dying hatred of mercenaries. The Terran Navy 
began sending their massive navy out towards the galaxy. There weren't nearly enough ships to guard every spaceport, even with the bloated size of the navy after repurposing all of their old warships. So they began to spread through the galaxy, slowly at first, placing fleets in central locations as to be able to respond to mercenary threats with rapid reaction forces. Often, a fleet of navy ships jumping in would scare the mercenaries enough to abandon their extortionate schemes. Few times did the navy ever have to fire a shot. Though the first year of the entire galaxy technically uniting with the Terran Federation, about a third of the galaxy was mercenary fleet, mostly the nations surrounding the original Terran Federation, but by now the mercenaries were getting desperate. Now they began taking control of stations, using their marines to land armies to directly threaten nations for money and material to continue to fund their mercenary bands. By now there were little more than bandits, still trying to brand themselves as protectors. It was at this point the mercenary war truly started, however. Many say that it started when the mercs attacked the Terran shipyards. After a few years of Terran naval anti-piracy actions and a few naval battles, the mercs were slowly hemmed into half the galaxy by the Terran navy, and the remaining mercenary company leaders finally grouped together to take down the navy, combining their fleets and completely changing their strategy. Suddenly, routine patrols were under attack, supply points were raided, and logistic ships were destroyed and looted. This shifted the Navy's outlook on the war from the largest anti-piracy operation in history to a war on, as we Terrans put it, terrorism. For the first year and a half, the Terran Navy was caught by surprise. They'd gotten slightly complacent by their victories and routine piracy operations that this sudden shift in strategy had caught them with the pants de, uh, sorry, Another Terran phrase, caught them unprepared. But the Terran Navy, ever adaptive, easily shifted footing to combat the Merc's new strategy of striking civilian targets and less defended logistical stations and hubs. Their demeanor was changed entirely from what they were before. Prisoners interrogated during this time claimed that the people of the galaxy abandoned their rightful protectors in favor for the Terran Navy, and they were enacting revenge. Revenge, such as orbital bombardment on planets host to Terran repair stations, or destroying civilian fuel stations that fueled the Navy. It was a bloody affair, and the war lasted for ten more years. Slowly, though, the Terrans fought back, commissioning new ships now with plasma technology borrowed from the new Federation applicants, which slowly replaced losses suffered during the first few years of the war and recruiting unanimously from the population of the other applicants to the Federation as auxiliaries, then as full-service soldiers. Though, many species and cultures had long since forgotten the martial traditions of their people. The Terran traditions seemed to fill in the blanks as more were recruited to fill in the ever-gaining losses. During the fourth year of the war, the first completely non-Terran battle group was assembled and deployed. The legendary 38th battle group that would be defend Sarkon 4 for four weeks against the mercenary Armada, outnumbering them six to one, and made it out with a fourth of their servicemen remaining. This also marked the first occasion that the Soul Star was granted to non-Terrans. A total of 2,345 servicemen were awarded, 2,231 of those being posthumously. The Soul Star being a medal of a great honor, awarded to those who did fantastical accomplishments in warfare and deserved recognition, whether alive or dead. However, by now the war had finally begun to gain momentum in the Terrans' favor once again. Despite every measure from the mercenaries to recruit, build new ships, steal new ships, or threaten the remaining nations in their occupied territories, they were simply unable to fight the Terran navy on equal footing anymore. Their ships began to be constructed quicker and worse as ships were poorly put together by the shipyards forced to build them, and launched half-baked in order to meet coming battles. Their crews were demoralized as many deserted, and were replaced by pressed ganged unwilling civilians who were kidnapped from planets the mercenary fleets were protecting. By the end of the eighth year of the mercenaries had been pushed back to their room of the eastern galaxy, with most of their original leaders dead or captured by Terran special forces. Often those captured were tried for war crimes and were either sentenced to death 
or life sentences in maximum security prisons. With many of the mercenaries either being imprisoned or left free due to the rampant impressment of innocence into the ships of the mercenaries, as such, many figured letting the lower-ranking mercenaries go free was better than imprisoning an unfortunate civilians. Finally, at the tenth year, on the November 23rd, the last mercenary stronghold was finally attacked and destroyed. Many know this day as Navy Day, a celebration of Terran Navy and Marines that finally vanquished the mercenaries from plaguing the galaxy. Now, as of today, all previously applicant nations to the Terran Federation have finally officially joined the Federation. The Terran Federation renamed itself the Galactic Federation in solidarity that it is no longer only Terrans, and the Navy, while much reduced from the massive buildup during the war, has remained strong presence in the galaxy, protecting trade lanes and other rim planets from pirates. And this time, the galaxy will not be doing away with it, the armed forces, lest the mercenaries return. Thank you all for coming to my lecture. I am Dr. James Gasson. Please leave a like and subscribe. End video. End of story. I would just quickly like to thank the T5 channel members and patrons. Caspar Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, Barky, It's Difficult to Pronounce, Lord Azrakul, and Arcadian.